Tonight, I'm going to tell you how we are all Africans. And um, I should say that I'm a philosophy professor. I am very interested in science. I have um, many of my best friends are string theorists and evolutionary biologists and cognitive scientists. I am currently at the University of California in Santa Cruz, but next year I'm going to be a visiting scholar at Stanford University where I'm finishing one book on maps we can talk about maps too, but not today. And then I'm going to start my next book on We Are All Africans, and I'm happy to get feedback from you on this book. The, um, the talk today is divided into three sections, always three. A thought experiment, then the facts, and then I'll end with why should we even care about philosophy? What can a philosopher of science add to the scientific discourse? Let me start by trying to um, frame this whole discussion with a thought experiment for you. Imagine, or remember, if you had this in gymnasia or in high school or bachillerato or wherever you went to high school, um, you might remember the Galapagos. You learned about the Galapagos um, with Darwin, and there were these 17 or so islands where different species of finches evolved. And the finches became more and more different over time because they were reproductively isolated and they were adapting to local conditions. So, for example, some finches um, ate cactuses in, on one island and other finches ate grubs on another island. And then just give it enough time and the finches become different species. It's a little bit like dogs here where you have an ancestral wolf-like dog, where we, are inter we don't interbreed the breeds, right? We want to keep them apart, and then we select certain traits, just like in the Galapagos. Over time, the variation within a group becomes variation between groups. Give it enough time, and you get something like primates, where our long cousins, the chimpanzees, um, are, very, are relatively similar to us. We share about 98% of our DNA. Um, gorillas, we share, we share somewhat less with. Um, but this is a case where just give it enough time and you get um, interspecies differences too. So it's not just that you get breeds that are different, but you end up getting species that are different. So imagine in your mind that the Galapagos writ large is what our human species would be like. This is a thought experiment. I'm not saying it's like this. But this would be one extreme thought experiment where just give it enough million years and the different groups would evolve differently. Contrast this with another scenario. This is the other extreme I sort of am giving to you as a thought experiment where you get on your spaceship, you travel out to planet Argon, you disembark, and an ambassador meets you. She's going to escort you to your important meeting, and you look around and you see everyone looks like this. You are, it's not, they, they, almost everyone looks like that. There's some, a little bit of variation, but then you're surprised when your ambassador tells you that everyone on the planet looks like that. It's not just in the capital city where you have just landed. So this is a case where everyone is identical, roughly, but even for the variation where they aren't identical, there is um, no intra-group, sorry, inter-group differences. There are no differences between the groups. Everyone on the planet is, differs in the same way. Every region of the planet differs in the same way. So I've been trying to motivate a sort of spectrum of possibilities that there might be for the human species. Do, are we a species where we are like the Galapagos writ large, where we basically are, there are these different groups, and um, the groups are very different genetically or phenotypically, or are we more like this 
admittedly fanciful thought experiment, but philosophers are good at thought experiments, where we have the planet Argon. So the question is, where are we along this spectrum? And that, that's the framing I'm going to use tonight. There's a genetic strategy here that we can use, which is that we, what biologists do, is they look at genetic sequences differences across individuals and groups. So a different way to visualize the difference between the Galapagos writ large and planet Argon is to either look, imagine, um, Jay talked about, <laughs> Jay talked about white, black, or yellow, but of course there's a missing color, which is the one I have on, which is red. Red is the quintus, you know, anthropological category for American Indians, but that's what these four circles represent. So the question is, are groups very different, or is there a lot of overlap between the groups? The, think about if there were a lot of overlap between the groups, that means that you could be more similar Let's say you're Danish. You could be more similar as a Dane to someone from Spain than you could be to someone who lives down the street from you and is also Danish. That's what this scenario would be, whereas this scenario would be that if, um, well, let's, we have to widen the scope. Let me be even more extreme. You could be Danish and you could look, uh, sorry, you could be more similar genetically to uh, someone from Ghana than you might be from some other person in Denmark, okay? And th that would be this situation, whereas this situation would be like all Ghanese are one kind of thing and all Danes are another kind of thing. I'm gonna tell you in the second part of the talk when I look at the facts that the genetic data suggests very strongly well, it doesn't suggest, it shows very strongly that this is more the scenario, that we're more like, much more like planet Argon in this thought experiment. So I will now turn to, oh, I shouldn't do this. <laughs> I have this little thing here. Um, to turn now to the facts. In a recent paper, you know, researchers are always talking about their most recent paper or their book or something like that, but, well, that's what we do, that's what we get paid for. So in a recent paper called Race and Biology, which is going to appear in the Routledge Companion to the Philosophy of Race, um, I write an article <laughs> where I summarize seven theses or seven facts about human genetic variation, the sort of global structure of human genetic variation. We have very low nucleotide diversity, and I'll say something more about that in a minute. I'm just going to read them, and only the ones in bold I'm going to talk about. If you want to talk about the other ones, we can do so during the questions or at the bar. Small interspecies differences, widely distributed alleles, there are a few private alleles, I'll get, I will say just a tad about that. This one I'll say a lot about. Non-African variation is basically a subset of African variation. Don't worry if you don't quite get that, I will say more about it. Most genetic variation is among individuals within populations, but even so, clustering and classifying individuals is reliable. And this one I won't say much about at all. The further apart on human migration routes that two populations are, the less genetically similar they are. You can go read my article if you want the whole story. All right. I'm going to start by just saying a little bit about low nucleotide diversity. This represents different species of organisms, animals and plants. And this here, I don't want to get into the technical measures tonight. I'm happy to speak to you if you like about how biologists actually measure these things with mathematical formulas. Um, it can go, this scale only goes up to 1.4%. I thought about putting HIV on there, you know, the virus that causes AIDS, but HIV would totally collapse this scale. HIV has a nucleotide diversity worldwide of about, depending on what proteins you look at, 20 to 30 or even 40 percent. 
So it would collapse everything into practically zero. So I didn't put HIV up there. But all of you have, many, most of you have probably heard of cheetahs, right? Cheetahs are those beautiful big cats that run in the African savanna, are the fastest cats. But they've gone through a massive genetic bottleneck, so they basically have 0% genetic variation. They have no variation among them. This is not good for their future evolutionary prospects. But they're sort of the standard planet argon case. And a lot of the other big cats have very little genetic variation. Even your house cat has little genetic variation. Dogs have way more genetic variation. Um, bonobos have little genetic variation, but we're kind of a fun species of primates that has relatively little compared to some of our um, cousins, chimpanzees and gorillas. And then plants have a lot of variation. Drosophila is a fruit fly. Um, also has a lot of variation. But what I want you to take away from here is if we look comparatively at other species, us as a species, we have very little genetic variation. And now um, I'm going to... <laughs> now that we get to Africa, I'm going to... I'm not going to tell you what this is. You should know what this is. I know there's a South African sitting, uh, standing in the bar, so she can tell you. Um, Non-African variation is a subset of African variation. This is a qualitative. It doesn't really tell you very much. It's more impressionistic. It's an artistic rendition, practically. But the idea is that each of these dots represents like the red here, the green here. I'm shaking a bit, so I can't really keep it still. The, don't, um, the yellow here. And um, those represent alleles. I need to just do, sorry for those of you who do biology, and it's going to be terribly boring, but I need to just for one minute explain what an allele is, OK? <laughs> because it confuses people. If you remember back also to your high school days when you learned about Darwin, think about when you learned some basic genetics. We have on our DNA sequence, think of it as a long line, even though it's a terrible simplification and idealization. You look at one gene, every gene has some kind of function. It could be a gene for eye color, a gene for some blood protein, a gene for an enzyme involved in metabolism, for example. Every gene has some function. And genes tend to come, not always, but often, in different flavors different types. So you could have, for example, a gene, this is a myth actually, but I'll just say it, I'll perpetrate the myth, the gene for blue eye color and the gene for um, brown eye color. But the idea is that we all have a lot, we have different alleles. For every gene, you only have two alleles because every gene is found in the chromosome. Chromosomes are paired. So every one of us only has two alleles per gene. But as a population, we can have many kinds of alleles, right? especially consider if anyone, if all of us had different alleles, we'd have a very large number of alleles in the population. Okay, enough about alleles. But each of these, um, each of these circles represents an allele, and most alleles are different. Uh, sorry, most alleles are found in Africa, and then they sort of lose as we move along. This is not an impressionistic picture. <laughs> this is an actual technical drawing from a scientific journal by my, uh, a colleague, and I, would, um, I think we consider each other friends, um, Noah Rosenberg at Stanford. And um, we, what he draws here is, um, he draws, first notice the continents, Africa, Europe, Middle East, Central South Asia, East Asia, Oceania, which is, you know, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, the Micronesia, Melanesia, um, um, Australian Aborigines, the Maori in New Zealand, and then America. Okay, so that's the geographic regions. What do these numbers represent? These numbers represent percentages of alleles that are shared. So Africa, so the way to read this is if you look at Europe, of all the alleles in Europe, how many are also found in Africa? Well, the answer is 87%. Of all the alleles found in Africa, how many are also found in Europe? It's 74% only. 
And what I, here's the pattern I want you to observe that happens in this picture. You have 87 here, 87 here, 87, 87, 90, 88. What this means is that most alleles found in different regions of the world are also found in Africa, but not vice versa, right? If you look at Oceania, it's only 69% of the alleles in Africa are also found in Oceania. And in the Americas, you have to look at the lines going down, in the Americas, only 63% um, of the alleles found in Africa are also found in the Americas. So there's a loss of alleles as we move out from Africa. And what you have to keep in mind is that this um, uh, this, this loss as we move out, f I, I need to say two further things. Don't take the numbers too literally. 87%, 87% doesn't mean it's the same 87% of the alleles. They can be overlapping sets. Does that make sense? They can be overlapping sets of alleles that get lost. And there are a few alleles that are called private alleles, but there are very few private alleles. A private allele is an allele, say, only found in Europe or an allele only found in Oceania, but there are very few of those. There's only somewhere of like three to four per, or five percent of those, of all alleles are private. So we get this pattern that as we move away from Africa, there are fewer alleles. It's, and why is that? Well, it's not that hard to think of why that is. It's because we've moved out of Africa. This is a map from a very nice review article by Cavalli Sforza, who's one of the big guys in this, and Mark Feldman. And about 100,000 years ago, we moved out of Africa. These dates are controversial. Don't put too much emphasis on them. But I do want you to notice that out of Africa, first to the Middle East, then to Central Asia, then up to Europe, down to Oceania, and then much later to the Americas. And just for a moment, Imagine another prejudice you might have. You might, we live in a world of seven billion people. That is totally new. For most of our evolution, there were less than probably 40, 20 million people on the entire planet. There were very few people for most of our evolution. So as we moved, and, and probably the originating population was only 10,000 maybe 100,000, somewhere between 10 and 100, the numbers are debated, etc. And I won't get into the theory, um, but effective population size, look that up if you like, I'm not going to say more about it. But the effective population size of the human species is about 10,000 individuals. Um, <clears throat> so as we moved out, every time you move, there's a sm only a small number of people moving. So they're only taking a small sample of all the alleles in the original population. So they move over here, and then they do their thing, they reproduce, and they have babies, and they eat, and they try not to get killed by the new predators in the place, and they try to build their huts, etc. And then a number of them move over here. And this goes on and on. And each time they move, they're only you're only sampling a subset of all alleles, so you get allele loss. You get loss of what's called genetic variation. And um, this is a picture showing, this is also from a, a scientific paper that came out about 10 years ago. It's only about 10 years ago or so that we really had very good genetic data showing us that um, the further away you were from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, the further away, and some of us in the audience have been in Addis Ababa, the further away you are from Ethiopia, the less genetic variation you have. But it's totally interesting that the correlation is so tight. If you know any science, you know this is a damn good statistical line. This has an R squared of about 0.76. It's an extremely tight link, so it really is very informative about the decrease in genetic heterozygosity is a function of how far away you get from Ethiopia. I should say one other thing. I'll go back to the map just for a minute. There's a very exciting thing 
that has happened since Cavalli's Force and Feldman did this, and you had one person, Esquivilosleu, who's been here to talk about this. Um, it's about Neanderthal DNA. And it's very exciting in genomics, and anyone who cares about these kinds of questions about race and history of the human species, is how um, there's every one of, on average, most of us carry two to eight percent of Neanderthal DNA. Neanderthal are a sister species of Homo sapiens. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about how, and we're still just learning many details. But what's interesting about Neanderthals is that they only lived in Europe and Asia. They didn't live in Africa because they also evolved out of Africa. So even though they have African DNA, as it were, because we all evolved out of Africa, even gorillas and chimpanzees, etc. And Darwin made that observation in one of his books, The Descent of Man. He said, man probably evolved right here because that's where we see chimps, gorillas, etc., which are our cousins and bonobos. So Darwin also knew that. Um, <clears throat> but Neanderthals only lived up here. What's interesting is that African populations, even today, don't actually have Neanderthal DNA. But Neander, because but it all depends on how you define the origin, and we're still learning all kinds of things, but we also know Neanderthals must have evolved out of Africa. Okay. I did want to say just that about Neanderthals. So genetic variation declines as we move away from Africa. Okay. Let me just say, and by way of wrapping up this section on facts, there's a very well-known Har well, Harvard professor Richard Lewinton, who I correspond with at length about these questions, um, who wrote an influential study in 72 that has many good parts, but it also has a lot of politics in it, and we will get to the politics, I promise you. Um, what he basically found, though, is he looked at blood proteins. He looked at 17 blood proteins. And he looked at their gene frequencies in different populations. These are his terms, Caucasoid, white, Negroid, African, so the European, African, Asian. And what he did was he looked at the alleles, we're back to alleles, and he looked at how frequent these different alleles were in these different populations. If you thought about classical anthropology, right, where uh, um, African tribes are just like almost a different kind of species than the European peoples, etc. This, these kinds of frequencies would be the ones you expected. You would expect a Galapagos writ large. This would be what you would find most of the time. Let me just say though, just notice that the allele frequencies always have to add up to one because it's all the types of alleles you have at one gene and they have to add up to one. If we had these, if these were like most of our genes, we would be like the Galapagos writ large. But the, most of our genes are more like this. That is, yes, there's variation, but most of the variation is within races rather than between races, meaning um, for most of our frequencies, there's only a tiny bit of difference between what the, the allele frequencies African populations have versus European populations have. And what Lewinton basically found out is that 85% of all human genetic variation is among individuals within populations. That means if you take all Danes, 85% but it's, it's, sorry for saying it, in Danish populations, it's probably more like 75% or something like that of all human genetic variation is here. Whereas if you took um, some, Stephen Jay Gould, another famous biologist, wrote that you could reconstruct roughly the human species by taking about 100 individuals, 30 from each of three villages in South Africa. Three villages in South Africa, you could reconstruct something like 95% of all human genetic variation. So it's, this is an average measure, 
And it is true that African populations have more of that variation, say, than Northern European populations. But what was so interesting about Lewinton's results is that only 10% is among populations within races. So think, for example, of the Ghanese versus Ethiopians versus Zulus in South Africa. Only 10% is among those populations, or in Europe, between the Sami of Finland, Sardinians in Italy, and the Irish. And, and a tiny fraction is among races, only 5% is among races. So this really, when this, this was a bomb when this article came out in 72, when he was looking at the genetics. Because look, everyone was expecting it to almost be the opposite. People were thinking, like, you know, if you have a classical anthropological, I'm not dissing anthropology, anthropology is great, but the sort of 19th century typological essentialist anthropology was that these human peoples are just fundamentally different. But that's what the genetics belies that. The genetics sort of sticks it to the man, as it were. Um, it, it, it shows that that's not the case. Most variation is among individuals within small groups not between races. And that's an empirical question. It may not have been that way. If this had been done maybe millions of years from now, who knows? But we are much more like planet Argon than Galapagos today. Even so, even so, clustering and, and classifying individuals is reliable. What this shows is, this is like taking a bunch of individuals and throwing them into a multidimensional space where each dimension is a gene, and then along that dimension you have the different alleles, and then you do what scientists call a principal component analysis, which basically tries to explain the correlation that explains most of the variance. I won't get into the details there because that would be a separate lecture on statistics and probability theory. Um, but what you find when you, e even, but think about it, even small differences like this, 0 0.62, 0 0.64, if you did it with enough loci, if you looked at Let's say I have, um, I, I, let's say I have an allele which you would expect to, ha okay, yeah, let's go back to this. Let's say I had an allele um, here, I was AU, and someone from Ghana was AUA. No, let's just look at me. I'm AU, and so then you might say, well, I'm more likely from this population than this population, but that's not terribly informative. That doesn't really reduce my uncertainty about which population I'm from. But if I also look at this gene, and then you tell me that I am um, here, I am XGA, then that gives me even more information that I probably am from white, uh, European population rather than from an African population. And keep on doing that with enough genes, and you will fairly soon after about 12 loci or so, be able to, you won't misclassify people anymore. So you can tell by just looking at their DNA after 12 loci or more, with high degree of certainty that say they are African rather than European. But don't be fooled. Even if you can, your group is not your destiny. Even so, my allelic structure, all the alleles I, this is just a statistical measure, all the alleles I have could still be more similar to someone from Ghana than someone from the town down the road in Denmark, where I was born, where my genes are from, as it were. Um, okay, I always do this in classes. Does this make sense? <laughs> are there any questions? <laughs> are there any questions? Yeah. Good. Excellent question, and I don't have a slide for this. Um, are there any? Is there any? Re do I, is there any evidence? And I'm almost done with the facts, so I'm happy you got you gave me this question. Is there any evidence for that five percent that there are differences? Yes. The short answer is yes. I'll give you. I mean, this was also a bomb. Just a few years ago, um, 
Sabeti, I can't remember her first name, a professor at Harvard, she showed, uh, and her group showed, that actually there, <laughs> there is skin color, there's a certain condition, uh, certain alleles which are involved in melatonin production, are massive, for that one gene, there's a huge frequency difference, it's almost one zero, so, like, it's 100% in Africans and 0% in Europeans. Chinese are interesting, they, they complicate things because they're interacting with other genes. But that's a separate story. Um, but that's one example, yes. There are cases where the five, we know something about that 5%. Yes, I will get back to that. Okay. I've repeated them here. And so where are humans along the thought experiment spectrum? Well, we're somewhere uh, like here, close to Argon, but not quite at the end. Of course, I wanted to play with the Vitruvian man, so I put up, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man, but I put up the Vitruvian woman. Um, and so we're somewhere here, okay? That's what the facts tell us. But I'm a philosopher. <laughs> I'm also a scientist. I have degrees in science or biology, evolutionary biology. But I care about philosophy, and I was talking to a friend, Christian, earlier today. I care about philosophy and what I'm going to call local philosophy rather than first philosophy. I teach first philosophy when I teach introduction to philosophy. I have 250 students who want to learn, well, they don't want to learn, but who learn. Um, <laughs> who learn about Plato and Aristotle and Leibniz and Descartes and Kant, Wittgenstein, etc., etc. That's first philosophy. That's where philosophy is almost like another science. It tells us what the basic metaphysics and ontology is of the world, and it tells us how we know things, and it tells us when are we wrong and when are we right, and it's a party pooper about um, ethical and political questions. That's first philosophy. I love it. It's not primarily what I work on, though. What I work on is what I'm going to call local philosophy. Local philosophy is where you use philosophical tools and methods thinking about scientific methodology, or you think about um, critique, and I'm going to give you some tools, and then that is what philosophy helps scientists, helps maybe historians, helps, in Danish you talk about fates, Wissenschaftstheorie. That is what local philosophy is for me, and for others I know in the audience, like Klaus Emeke, is that Philosophy is like a help or a consultant almost to science. So here are five answers I'm going to give you to why philosophy. How can philosophy help us in this debate? You might think scientists are going to get bored and think, why do I need you? Well, <laughs> some scientists I hear think, why do you need me? But that's not. But some also are quite interested. Frame, you, we can frame problems clearly via thought experiments. We learn and we teach how to make relevant distinctions. We track ethical concerns. We critique and we envision possible futures. And I'm going to say a little bit about each of these. And this is from uh, Nabru, and it doesn't, it's not there anymore. Um, but I really like this little piece that says, Mark kontrollier Janeves kontrollier rasten and akin, and it's a puppet, right? And the idea, the rough, trend, well, power um, controls, brainwashing controls the rest. And philosophers are good critics of society and how, um, you know, how we do things, how we could do things better and how we could think things more clearly, etc. And one way we do that is we help frame problems clearly via thought experiments. So I tried to give you a thought experiment to help you understand some of the issues at stake here. We also make relevant distinctions. Um, this is, again, from this paper where I think about different notions of race. 
Everything I've talked about up to now is what I call biogenomic. Is there a genetic structure in human populations and what is it? That's an empirical question. We basically know the answer. There's a little bit of structure, but not very much. And here's, again, it's because we're a young species, relatively few individuals, and um, we're fairly homogenous already, or we were fairly homogenous. Then there's the semantic question. Does this genetic structure correspond to extant designations of populations in different languages? Think about all the curse words that you, you know, we use for people that look differently from us. Do those correspond to actual genetic uh, groups? Very basically, the answer there is not really. <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that right now. The problem I find incredibly interesting, and it gets back to the 5% question, is does the genetic structure correspond to significant genetically based differences for socially important variables? For example, if there were differences, say, in skin color, obviously skin color is socially important because it's related to how we treat people, how racism happens, how there's systematic discrimination and oppression, at least in some countries. Obviously, the U.S. has a very turgid and, and difficult history with this, as does South Africa, etc. cetera. Um, but, um, Skin color, I would call, though, an indirect. Because here's the case that I think is even more hard, <laughs> is whether things, characters like intelligence and IQ, is there a difference between races in intelligence and IQ? That's a valid question. And could that 5%, I've told you, we found skin color differences in that 5%. But could intelligence or intelligence differences also reside in that 5%? Let me immediately say before we get too hot and heavy about this, that we are all basically the same. Remember, we're 99.9% .9 different in our genome. So that means pretty, I think Chomsky was basically right. Most of us have very general cognitive universal machinery. It just comes with who we are <laughs> as human beings. But then the right-wing politician is going to tell you, yeah, but what about that 5%? Couldn't there be difference in the IQ between that 5%? And that's where you get the debate. I'm only going to gesture. You get a debate between someone like Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote a book called The Mismeasure of Man, which is a critique of thinking in terms of racial differences of IQ, and Herrnstein and Murray, who write a book um, about 10, 10, 15 years later, called The Bell Curve, where they say there are racial differences in IQ. East Asians are genetically smarter than Europeans, who are genetically smarter than Africans. And that's what this book argues. So there is a debate here, the 5%. What I, as a philosopher, would say is we don't know. We don't know enough. We may never know enough. But even more, intelligence, and here is why I have Howard Gardner, something like intelligence just seems to be such a multifarious, so many aspects to it. Gardner talks about multiple intelligences, kinesthetic, musical, artistic, natural. What about all those intelligences? Intelligence becomes a very hard thing to measure. Let me just return very quickly here. There's also a social race question. Are there racialized social kinds? I think most philosophers would say yes, absolutely, because that's why we have discrimination. They're not saying we should have that, but they're saying we do have that. There are um, socialized racial kinds. But that needn't, and this is where the philosopher comes in, that's not the same question as whether there are biogenomic races. You could have social race without biogenomic race. Hell, you could even have social race without biological race. So you could still discriminate people, etc., even though we all had the same IQ, or you know, there was the same distribution of IQs across the different groups. Another way that philosophers can help is to track ethical concerns. 
And this I take from a paper I recent, uh, recently published in one of the, the journals of my field, the flagship journal of my field, Philosophy of Science, that tracks ethical concerns. Richard Lewinton, two Cambridge biologists, one from Harvard, Cambridge, Massachusetts, one from England, Cambridge, England, who I just interviewed, I interviewed him for nine hours last week, I, over three days. Very interesting. Lewinton, in this bombshell of a paper, wrote the following. The same one where I showed you the table and the different frequencies, he writes, human racial classification is of no social value and is positively destructive of social and human relations. Since such racial classification is of virtually no genetic or taxonomic significance either, no justification can be offered for its continuance. What he's saying is, because we're all basically the same, and we vary in the same way, and only 5% is among races, um, we should just give up the concept altogether. I should immediately say, Lewinton is a self-avowed Marxist, he's a leftist, and he's proud of it. And has been so since he was in diapers, practically. Edwards writes the following. He's much more conservative kind of guy, Mr. Edwards. But it is a dangerous mistake to premise the moral equality of human beings on biological similarity, because the similarity, once revealed, then becomes an argument for moral inequality. So what he's saying is, you're, you shouldn't start with the biology and make it an empirical question whether we're equal or not. You should just start by saying we are equal. We are morally equal, and then whatever the biology may tell us in the end, don't mix your moral position with your scientific position. So there's an interesting set of debates here that you can read our paper. We talk about this debate. <laughs> okay. Here's another uh, place that ethical concerns come in in all of this. It's so-called personalized genomics. Um, Lone Frank and a few others have this movie, I can't, it's 23 and me, no, it's the, 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 hmm? Genetic me. Genetic me, which sounds very narcissistic, but anyway, yes, genetic me. Um, but this is 23 and me, which is a company in the Bay Area that s tells you a saliva-based service helps you know more about yourself. With reports on over 100 health conditions and traits, here are a few of the things you can learn about you. Your inherited conditions, your drug response, traits, drug means to medicine, right? And your genetic risk factors. Um, well, I figured I'd add the little footnote. Um, genetic risk factors like for cancer, Alzheimer's, etc. Not only that, but for the, pr for the same price, and the first time is not free, um, for the same price, it's about $300, it can tell you what your ancestry is. How? The same way I told you before. With the, they use the same models. It's the same dudes that developed those models of clustering, developed 23andMe. Noah Rosenberg is one of the people involved. Um, they, so they can tell you what your ancestry is. But here, I know it's less a worry in Denmark, but in the US there's a huge worry about insurance companies. If insurance companies find out what your genetic data is and what your predispositions, they can ramp up the price on your premium, et cetera. And so there's all kinds of ethical and political questions involved here. Philosophers can help with that. Um, maybe. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm almost near the end. It's taken 43 minutes. Uh, philosophy, here's one of my heroes. Um, I have t two heroes that I'm presenting today. John Dewey is one of them. He writes, philosophy is criticism, criticism of the influential beliefs that underlie culture, a criticism which traces the beliefs to their generating conditions as far as may be, which tracks them to their results, which considers the mutual compatibility of the elements of the total structure of beliefs. So it's criticism that looks at the history what is the history of our paradigms? What are the history of our assumptions, both our political assumptions and our scientific assumptions? What are their results? What kind of futures, what kind of consequences can result from our assumptions? And what, how are they compatible? Some of our beliefs may be paradoxical. They may um, work against each other. I was going to just say a couple of things. I'll be very quick here. My general research program, why I care as a philosopher, I care because I just find it genuinely interesting how we're humans and have worked across the world. It's walked across the world and this and that. 
But I also am interested in when models become the world. When do our abstractions, our theoretical abstractions, get confused with the world in such a way that we are imposing our views on the world? Like, for example, when Richard Dawkins writes The Selfish Gene, and he sees everything as just genes battling it out on the stage of natural selection, and then you, every individual gene just sort of does its own thing, and they're selfish just like we are selfish, when might that view hold, and when does it not hold? I, I, I fear that Richard Dawkins, as others, um, have universalized their theory. And I really care about trying not to universalize and not taking your theory too far. Theories work well for some things, just like a hammer works well to bang a nail, but you don't take a screwdriver to bang a nail. Yes? So different theories work for different domains. And that, those are the kinds of questions I care about because I, to give you a joke, I care, what does an artist and a scientist have in common? Anyone know this joke? What do an artist and a scientist have in common? They both fall in love with their model. <laughs> and this has good sides and it has bad sides. When you think your model, your, it actually is an idealized, simplified model, but you look in the mirror and you see a lion that can explain and eat everything. Or when you create an economic model of markets, and then you step into that model and the world looks so neat and simple. But that was never the world. Where's the kitchen? Where's the bathroom? So those are the kinds of questions that I care about in my own research. Last question. We can also envision possible futures. And here's another hero of mine, Michel Foucault. I shall take as my starting point whatever unities are already given, such as psychopathology, medicine, or political economy, I'll added evolutionary genetics. I shall make use of them just long enough to ask myself what unities they form. I shall accept the groupings that history suggests, only to subject them at once to interrogation, to break them up, and then to see whether they can be legitimately reformed or whether other groupings should be made. The point is that we can ask all these questions about how we are using or abusing these models to make generalizations and inferences about human races. And I don't, want to, I don't have a strong political opinion, and I'm certainly not going to say it in front of 300 people or 400 or how many there are, but I will say that I think what philosophy can do is to help us think more critically about whatever views we hold and to try to give a common framework to discuss across political spectrum, as you know, we have a... <laughs> there's an election happening in this country. Um, philosophers can also maybe help to establish... Um, a dialogue and to, and to critique and maybe to envision possible futures, so to think critically. And let me just, if I may, give you just one reason why I also find all this fascinating is that I come from a very confusing background. This is the U.S., which is very appropriate that it's blurry, and I didn't quite get the outline right, but these are four, the four countries where I have lived in for extended periods of time in my life, and um, I, find, um, I find myself very confused both about who I am and what this world is, and what I see myself as doing, and I hope I've done that a little bit today, is to help you think critically and ask questions about both scientific themes and philosophical themes and how we can apply philosophy back to science. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you.